thank you very much uh, ms francisca and dr ori and other colleagues uh, please let me know if i am being here clearly yeah we can hear you thank you very much i am going to start my screen um, good evening from pakistan everybody uh, i am munibur rahman i am serving as the deputy registrar in the cooperative department government of the punjab pakistan this is my second time that uh, i am having the opportunity to present my paper in this conference uh, i am thankful uh, to the organizers as well as the uk society for the cooperatives to accept my paper and uh, besides that uh, i am the covid survivor i remain hospitalized in the month of april for 22 days on the mechanized breathing and thanks to allah almighty that this miracle Uh, brought me back to life, and I am once again with you people. So I am going uh, to talk about the institutionalization of cooperation between cooperators and cooperatives. This is the case study of a Shakargarh Zarai Cooperative Union, which is situated at Hsil Shakargarh, District Narwal, Pakistan. So here, how we will proceed? we will start from the introduction touching the cooperative profile of the study site and we will discuss the six cooperative principle which is the foundation for the cooperation among the cooperators then we will discuss need significance and benefits of the cooperation among the cooperators how the concept of cooperation among the cooperators can be professionalized through scandium societies unions and federations then we will focus on our study uh, case study that is the shakargarh zarai cooperative union as in shakargarh district narowa as we all are well aware what cooperative is just to give a glimpse of what concept of cooperative is uh, which is a proven initiative of self help mutual it in get up lifting of its followers ensuring good security and empowering women providing affordable finances to its members creating decent jobs social strength and the decision making efficiently addressing the common economic social and cultural needs and aspirations of the members so our study site is a small town of shakargarh which is situated in the district narowal Pakistan, where all cooperative institutions are agricultural cooperatives. Uh, the Tehsil Chakargarh comprises of seven eighty-eight villages, where two zero nine villages have cooperative societies, and five seventy-nine villages are without any cooperative societies. There are eighty-five Zarai societies. Zarai in local language means agricultural industry society. and there is a one union that is every cooperative society which is the practical form of cooperation among the cooperatives so what is the need significance and benefits of cooperation among the cooperatives cooperation as we know serve their members most effectively and strengthen the cooperative movement by working together through local national regional and international structures cooperation is about unity we all know first without the unity a cooperative cannot survive cannot exist just as members owners form cooperatives to achieve common goals cooperatives themselves join forces through national organizations such as unions federations and associations the goal of cooperative business is the satisfaction of the needs and the desires of the members owners who are also main customers of the cooperatives since the business is a cycle cooperatives don't aim to take customers from each other cooperation among the cooperatives will make them more productive and things get done more quickly and efficiently this is the basic for the cooperation if there is no cooperation if there is no unity among the cooperators uh, there will be 
no difference between the cooperatives and a non cooperative institution uh, cooperative has the purpose that is to realize the economic cultural social needs of the organization's members and its surrounding community so to achieve this purpose cooperation among the cooperators must be cooperating with each other cooperation is mandatory for this purpose uh, cooperation when institutionalized voices the stakeholders to and bring the cooperatives as the inclusive player in the economy because a primary cooperatives are single cooperatives is a single entity but when united in the form of uh, some union or federation they have a significant voice to be heard in the stakeholders as well as in the decision makers cooperatives among the cooperative take practical form through secondary societies that is cooperative unions like the one which is under study cooperative federations like district cooperative federations and cooperative associations regional cluster of primary cooperatives like uh, housing cooperatives clusters uh, uh, these are the kind of uh, secondary societies available in pakistan so the chakargarh agricultural or zarai cooperative union which is a case study being discussed now this is the secondary cooperative society which was formed in 1973 it is the platform to voice 85 primary agricultural cooperatives which are the members of this union in the tehsil chakargarh district narwar pakistan chakargarh basically is a border tehsil and it was adversely affected by war as a result of indian invasion in 1971 and the culture of, uh, the area was vastly devastated because of that war so in order to rehabilitate in the vital area the cooperatives played a vital role and primary primary cooperative societies were established for rehabilitation and reception of the normal life activities in the area this initiative brought uh, opportunities of employment and earning through poultry bubble industry flour grinding mills on these these are the small scale industries uh, on the coffee basis and also provided marketing services to the members the union was set up as a representative body of the primary co-ops in the area provided raw material its objective was to provide raw material to the member societies marketing bridge that is to market their products and acted as a collective bargaining agent for the member societies also it provided storage facilities for the products of the member societies the concept of cooperatives among uh, cooperation among the cooperatives it appears to be practically transformed in uh, through this uh, cooperative union the platform ensures stability of prices creation of more and more jobs for the members co-ops and above all it helps eliminate exploitation of the middleman by traditional market forces it also resulted in self sufficiency of the members cooperatives member cooperatives and creating resources to run the projects for the members without external financial support Uh, this in, in initiative also brought sustainability in cooperative business and it is being replicated in other sectors of cooperatives like in housing uh, as well as it was replicated in the district bihari uh, district in the province in the southern area where uh, livestock dairy cooperatives were united to a life of dairy union as well as in the central punjab where housing cooperatives were united in the form of a housing federation so thank you very much uh, i will share my e full paper uh, uh, to the organizers of uk society for cooperatives and any question regarding the uh, case study thank you very much munid for for your talk um 
the floor is open for, for questions and comments. So if you'd like to either use the uh, function at the bottom of the screen, um, if you're already, or ready, um, or if you prefer to post a comment or question in the chat, that'd be monitored to Rory. You are muted, Rory. Unmuted, yeah. Um, you you said that the the, the secondary co-op makes things quicker and more efficient. I'm just wondering how, how it does so. I mean, I would imagine there are considerable coordination costs um, that can get in the way. I mean, I'll give you an example, a working example, which was some years ago um, within my part of the university, they introduced team teaching. So we had two, usually three people involved in the delivery of each course, which in the first instance was very hard work. So to sort out all of the meetings that you needed to sort out what each person would do certainly slowed things slowed things down, but we did pay a di we did get a dividend in later years in terms of flexibility. So this when does this quick quickness and efficiency happen, and what do you have to do before you arrive at a quick and, and efficient cooperative union? I hope that makes sense. Do you need me to repeat any of that? So you need me to uh, comment on, on that aspect, how cooperatives uh, will make things happen more quick and more efficient? Can you say something about the, the coordination activity that had to occur before you reach something more efficient. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, the primary corporate societies have very limited sources in that area. So they have lesser access to the market, they have lesser opportunities for employment, but when the resources are put together in the form of a union, they have a collective bargaining agent in the form of a union. So there is a less chance of exploitation of the price uh, of the, in, in the form of prices or prices instability through the traditional market forces like middlemen or broker. Uh, furthermore, um, when they are united in the form of a uh, cooperative union, they have uh, easy and efficient access to the raw material. Thus, uh, they can uh, have improved. Uh, they can they, 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 they can improve their product. So this way, the things happen more quickly and more efficiently. Sorry, you're muted again. Are you trying to say something? No. Okay. Um, so, uh, any more questions or comments for Muni? I don't seem to see. Maureen. Uh, oh, Maureen, Maureen. <laughs> um, it's just a comment. I um, I thought it was really nice the way you said above all that the um, inter-cooperation um, uh, manages to avoid the traditional exploitation that you get um, in uh, in uh, normally in the market. And because I, I think we don't make enough of um, of how co-ops. Um, actually allow voices to lots of different stakeholders, particularly if you can get um, co-ops in different, uh, different sorts of co-ops cooperating with one another. So it's just a comment, but. Mm -hmm. Very good point, Maureen. Maureen, but is there anything you'd like to say in response to Maureen's comment? Yes, Miss um, um, Morin, uh, would you please repeat your comment? Because there were distortion at my end, so that made me difficult to understand. Sorry, um, I really appreciated you saying that getting co-ops to work together um, creates a market in which you avoid the usual exploitation that we get um, in more of sort of financially driven or you know, ordinary um, markets, because I think that is the point about a cooperative economy. Um, 
and it, it's I think you could I mean you could build that into how many different sorts of stakeholders can benefit from um, from cooperatives working together. That's a great yes, point. Agreed. That's yeah, agreed. Yeah, yes, agreed. Thank you very much for the appreciation. This is what cooperative means. This is what really cooperative means. Yeah. Is there anyone else that like to or ask a question? I can't see any. Oh, Suna. 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 Um, <clears throat> I was interested in, like, um, how, uh, yeah, how did it emerge? Who, um, where did the, was it the cooperators in the individual cooperatives who came to the idea that they need to come together? Or where did the impulse come from to, to build up this? Shared structure. Yes, uh, you your query is relate, relating to the concept or uh, the idea that how the primary cooperatives uh, got the idea to be together and form this organization. Is it so? Struggle to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually. Uh, Actually, the uh, cooperatives are organized and regulated by the government here in Pakistan. So this information was introduced by the government of Pakistan to uh, combine all the cooperatives uh, in the form of a secondary association. So this, is, this initiative was not introduced by the primary cooperatives, but by the government. Yeah. Is it clear? Not, not completely, to me. I, I still was okay, it gra okay, okay. the grassroots okay. or the cooperative, uh, cooperative. Was it driven from the bottom up? Okay, uh, the concept of secondary cooperative see, is not a member driven, but regulated by the government. Okay. Um, because cooperatives here in Pakistan are regulated by government, so primary cooperatives were united under the instructions, under the orders of the government. So all the unions and secondary cooperatives like federations, like associations, were not formed by the member cooperatives, but by the government. And this is voluntary by all the cooperatives to be part of this. Okay. Is it clear now, Dr. Rory? Yes. Yes, yes. Thanks for the clarification, Munib. There was a bit of an uh, interruption in the connection as well, so that didn't help, but we, we got it now. Thanks. <laughs> um, we have time much. for one or two additional questions or comments. Is there any? It doesn't seem to be the case, uh, but if colleagues... Um, um, you know, we will uh, want to reflect and perhaps have a discussion during the break. There is that opportunity as well between 4 and 4.30 p.m. So for the time being, we will move on to the second paper. But before that, um, please allow me to thank Munib again for his contribution to our annual conference. Thanks very much indeed, Munib. The next speakers are Suna Kovanev. Uh, I hope I have pronounced that okay, <laughs> and Anna Umanceva, who will be presenting a paper entitled Balancing Between Collaborative Transformation and Stability in Rural Eco-Social Entrepreneurship, an International Comparative Case Study. Uh, over to you both. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Sona, can you please share the slides? Hello, everyone. Yeah, uh, just a moment. I uh, share the slides and Anya will start with presenting. Do you see uh, the slides? Great. Thank okay. you. Go ahead. All right. Um, hello, everybody. We would like to present a paper ca called Balancing Between Collaborative Transformation and Stability in Rural Eco-Social Entrepreneurship, International Comparative Case Study. 
Um, it is a joint collaborative paper between uh, Suna and me. Um, Suna is um, um, an academic fellow at the uh, Brandenburg Technical University of Cottbus Sandtenberg. San I hope I pronounced it correctly in Germany um, and affiliated at the Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography in Germany. And uh, I am a PhD fellow in uh, Roskilde University in uh, Denmark. Um, this research is a part of an EU project called uh, Rural Action, um, generally uh, uh, about social entrepreneurship and social innovation in uh, structurally weak rural areas. It is an international project that covers several rural areas in um, EU countries and uh, generally aims at understanding and supporting social entrepreneurial processes in uh, these regions. Um, so in this paper, we are looking at organizations in rural contexts which aim at transitioning to collaborative practices in relation to work organization and decision making, economic sphere, by integrating elements of solidarity economy, as well as in the ecological dimension. We are analyzing to what extent the transitions of these organizations towards such practices allows them to uh, allows them or hinders them from maintaining organizational and social stability. So um, an essential part of this paper of this process uh, was dedicated to conceptual work. Um, how, do how do we define these things? How do we... Um... Suna, can you please go back to the first, to the previous slide? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, how do we uh, characterize these organizations and the practices they are engaging in? Were they already defined before us? Uh, do we need any new concepts? So first, I would like to talk a little about this uh, conceptual work. First of all, uh, the term collaborative practices. Um, what is collaboration? Being generally positioned in the empirical and theoretical field of rural social entrepreneurship and rural social innovation, collaborations are seen as a key element. However, collaborations are mostly approached in structural terms as formally established collaborations between different stakeholders, sectors, uh, actors, or institutional bodies. We decided to approach collaboration as an embodied and material joint practice, li largely inspired uh, by the scholarship of communities of practice. We wanted to approach collaboration as daily practice where ethical principles and interdependencies are in constant process of uh, being uh, renegotiated and uh, negotiated. Through empirical work, we identified collaborative practices in the following domains, decision-making decision and diverse participation, solidarity economy, and ecological dimension. And we will elaborate on them later in the presentation. Secondly, um, how do we define these organizations that we are looking at? The organizations we chose for the sample have diverse organizational forms and are united by the following aspects. They produce goods or services. In our sample, it's farming uh, or tourism. They self-identify as having an explicit societal and environmental objective and they aim at transforming practices of production and consumption in their localities. Defining them as rural entrepreneurs um, didn't seem to make justice to the variety of practices they carry out, since for-profit is not their uh, main motivation. Um, many aspects of these organizations correspond to the criteria um, often attributed to uh, social enterprises, for example, the EMS criteria. However, we decided to use the concept uh, eco-social enterprises because it better describes their organizations. Um, eco-social enterprises, this concept has been introduced by uh, uh, 
researchers Jovanisova and Frankova to describe organizations which sell goods and services in markets in order to enhance local well-being and ecological regeneration instead of private profit accumulation. Uh, also, they lean towards democratic ownership and non-monetized production practices. The organizations in the sample have these criteria to a greater or lesser degree. And Suna also will talk it, uh, about it later in the sampling uh, slide. Um, and lastly, what do we mean by stability? We look uh, at stability of these organizations because the practices they engage with uh, usually have a, relative, a relatively innovative character, meaning that the organizational structure or the agricultural production or the, the way they organize their sales are new for the area. And it is challenging for them to go through the startup phase and survive in the competitive market of the mainstream established organizations. By stability, we mean firstly organizational stability, the ability to, to stay afloat financially and to provide decent livelihoods for the participants in relation to working conditions. At the same time, keeping in mind that in many purpose-driven initiatives, basic needs are not understood only in economic terms. Uh, we also include non-market um, remuner uh, remuneration, such as the meaning of work, share of the produce or particip uh, participation in the community in terms of negotiating uh, their engagement and the risks which can uh, arise from it. Thus, we refer, uh, we refer to this aspect as social stability. Stability is, is especially approached here in terms of its rural context, which can relate to uh, little access to resources and support compared to urban areas which have a stronger civic networks, um, and especially the lack of skilled and active participants, uh, which can increase the risk of burnout of the uh, participants engaged uh, in the longer term. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here is a little uh, visual representation of the collaborative practices that we are looking at. Uh, and we are presented, presenting it here as a sort of uh, spectrum. Um, uh, the, uh, um, and the organizations that we are looking at are situated on uh, different parts of this spectrum. So the, uh, the dimensions of these collaborative practices are uh, on the one side, economic solidarity and uh, uh, formalized competitive exchange logic. Secondly, diverse participation versus centralized coordination and regenerative uh, ecological practices and um, extractive practices. Next slide, please. Yeah, no, thank you, Amy. Yeah, so that was about the uh, theoretical part and now I just briefly introduced the cases but before we then move on to reflect how do we, how did we then observe and find out about these practices in, in the end. Oh, excuse me. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so we uh, did conducted a qualitative um, comparative case study with interviews and focused ethnography uh, in the southeastern Alentejo in Portugal and northeastern Brandenburg in Germany in 2019. Some cases we studied by ourselves and some cases together. And um, yeah, here you see the overview of these uh, organizations and um, picture of one of them of these herbal farms. So um, um, yeah, I uh, hope my battery doesn't close out, but I will get my <laughs> loading cable straight away after this slide. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, yeah. Uh, so and we have uh, observed or pursued the most diverse case study design and uh, with, with, the with the intention that we wanted to kind of look at cases which to our knowledge, represent the most typical uh, ways and li livelihood ways of um, ecological production in the areas. So you can see that there are some uh, cooperatives and larger and also which you could consider um, multi-stakeholder or open cooperatives, but it's not, they are not only included in this research because indeed this family entrepreneurship is also very common in the regions. Um, yeah. 
and uh, all of them are uh, all, all except one are indeed engaging in agriculture and in addition the uh, other uh, Portuguese cooperative or producers cooperative or which we have titled as an acronym uh, has also a structure that we work apart from a local shop and uh, supporting local farmers in selling their produce they also provide a form for self-employed in the fields of uh, design and arts and uh, advisory services uh, for collective self-employment and uh, let's say collectivizing the risk and uh, gaining uh, social benefits via the cooperative. So they have kind of a larger aim. Yeah. In addition, uh, like two, two of the agricultural farms, uh, the one cooperative in Portugal and the other one in Germany is uh, practicing this community supported agriculture program, CSA. In short, yeah, and finally, um, concerning the actual practicing or what ha how you can imagine the organization in terms of participation and so on, like I mentioned, the cooperatives are kind of good examples of the type of new cooperativism where the membership is not only for producing members in agriculture but they have different types of uh, membership forms, so different types of participants with different interests or yeah, needs and um, uh, who also, for example, only rent the land or, or in the, indeed uh, in case of the other cooperative um, farmers who sell their produce or, uh, also without membership via the cooperative. And uh, then uh, the two, two, two ones below the family farms, the herbal farm and the ecotourism, they are again this kind of what you might imagine as as a typical family farm of a few workers and uh, owners. And then the one, uh, the Solavi, which is a German term for a CSA, is uh, something in between uh, because they have, again, like diverse participation, a lot of volunteers and so on, but uh, in not in a formal cooperative system. Yeah, and then I'll uh, give, Annika would continue then with the uh, first uh, insight to the empirical, uh, yeah, insights about diverse participation. Thank you. So the first uh, collaborative practice that we were looking at, uh, we refer to it as diverse participation and inclusive decision making. Um, what do we understand by diversity in our cases? Mostly, it relates to, on the one hand, younger, often highly educated people, uh, also often relatively newcomers in rural areas who share values of environmental and societal transformations. They can broadly be referred to as new rurals, a concept that recently appeared in re literature um, and characterizes these uh, new rurals uh, as innovative, or, uh, often innovative, entrepreneurial um, people who bring innovative ideas and are committed to changing practices. At the same time, it has been noted that sometimes they can be associated with uh, creating so-called uh, rural bubbles or even radical rural spaces uh, because of their different ideas. Um, in, and on the other hand, we look at uh, participation in these organizations of local population in our cases, it, it mostly refers to traditional farmers or farm workers. Um, we approach diverse participation and inclusive decision making as a positive phenomena that creates mutual learning processes. While at the same time, we are interested in the possible social instability that can emerge in diverse participation in terms of um, tensions and conflicts and also a possible lower efficiency because of time and resources for sustaining inclusive, uh, inclusive decision making. Um, um, yes, next slide, slide please. So our findings show that firstly, it is a challenge to make an organization driven by values of ecological regeneration and ethical economic practices diverse in rural context. Usually uh, they are established by new rurals and the startup phase requires the commitment of uh, likely minded individuals. In general, the diverse participation is higher in the uh, co-op cases than in family farms. But even in, um, in co-ops, uh, it requires 
management and leadership, which are value driven and are explicitly aimed at engaging diverse participation. Um, at the same time, we see that even when the value driven commitments to diverse participation and inclusive decision making is there, it is a lengthy process largely related to strong cultural norms as an obstacle. Uh, these deep-seated norms can be in relation to work processes, uh, for example, people who are used to more hierarchical leader-worker relations or traditional uh, farming practices. Um, next slide, please. As an example from our cases uh, that managed to create the space of diverse participation is user scope. Um, the factors in, uh, in Portugal, uh, the factors which contributed to it are strong value-driven leadership and management that on the one hand explicitly focuses on inclusion and um, well-being of local village population that implies active strategies of creating more workplaces for the locals and active strategies of engaging them in decision-making processes. And on the other hand, it is committed to ecological innovations, which attracts likely-minded committed volunteers and experts, which creates a diverse mix of people. Secondly, the organization is the most resourceful and the largest in the sample. And finally, the organizational structure ensures a local population's participation through formal employment, while many value-driven participants are attracted to the farm as volunteers or temporary employees. At the same time, despite, despite the active effort to turn the farm in the space of inclusive decision-making uh, with such pro practices as uh, sociocracy, for example, the respondents were observing that the working dynamic is still changing slow due to traditional working culture deeply seated in the local members. And the second is example, also a co uh, co cooperative uh, uh, that also is focused on diverse participation. Uh, it was established by young politically uh, and environmentally active people who want to engage local population in alternative farming and solidarity uh, economics. But unlike in the first example, where the locals are salaried employees. Here, there are no monetary obligations between the co-op and the local farmers, uh, only, volunte uh, only voluntarily membership. Thus, it is more challenging to create close ties and engage, more, uh, engage local population more. And in case of small um, enterprises, family owned, the obstacles to diverse participation can be small size and lack of resources as for example, uh, in a herbal farm situated in a re uh, very remote area that doesn't have resources to employ more than a couple of workers. And the area is too remote for attracting volunteers. In another example that doesn't practice diverse participation, uh, the ecotourism, it is simply not the focus of the organization. Um, at the same time, this organization, uh, which is centrally coordinated, uh, uh, succeeded to um, quickly adjust their production to, to ecological standards faster than in other cases. Um, and we um, also related to the central, uh, to the centrally coordinated structure. Thank you. Uh, Suna? Yeah. Now I would like to shortly uh, give you examples about the practices of economic solidarity. Um, yeah which basically means like uh, um, this informal uh, risk sharing um, between the participants and uh, taking care of each other's material needs, uh, let's say uh, beyond this uh, strict calculation of, uh, of the hours or uh, let's say um, commitment that, that somebody has been doing. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah. Indeed. So uh, we did observe solidarity economic relations in all except that ecotourism uh, case. Uh, and uh, But nevertheless, none of the cases was really able to rely on them. But uh, market income was in every, every organization was necessary in the end in order to ensure the income. However, of course, the uh, more solidarity based 
relations uh, are were important for diversifying the income and also important uh, let's say relations were learning to place learning about what does it mean to um uh let's say um yeah what does it mean to share the risk what, what kind of uh, emotions or fears are connected to that and this this kind of learning process were really important in in the organizations were practicing them uh, furthermore, they were, let's say, stronger and more ambitious uh, in the larger cooperatives, but also in the one, uh, another community supported farm, which was from a structure, a family farm. Uh, so therefore, they, they surely can be found across organizational forms. And an interesting example was that between the herbal farms, they were also emerging, although the herbal farms individually are let's say when you look at the relations in the farm between the workers and the owners it's a fairly conventional family farm but uh, when the farms collaborate between each other in uh, selling and transporting their herbs uh, abroad uh, there there this kind of solidarity emerged uh, on one hand when the farmers let's say yeah organize the transport organize the packaging they they really um, try to avoid competition and uh, yeah help each other without any direct remuneration and also, uh, even though they sell their export uh, via monopoly holding company abroad, and this monopoly exporter really yeah, yeah, has a lot of power over the farmers, they also try to be very flexible um, in their relations and, uh, let's say, assure that the farmers really get the income that they need, even though uh, the, the produce might fluctuate, the quality might fluctuate, and so on. So therefore, even in such uh, relations where, which might seem like a kind of traditional capitalist export relation on a value lowest level of a value chain, these kind of solidarity relations emerged uh, voluntarily. And uh, even though the individual farmers were largely uh, skeptic towards formal cooperative structures, which we also were discussing about. The other interesting example was when we looked at then uh, the, um, let's say the collaboration between, um, uh, yeah, between the uh, like the more intensive or maybe more uh, ambitious one, uh, especially the examples of the two com community-supported farms, like the users' cooperative in Portugal that Anya was just mentioning. Like indeed, in the employment policy, their solid solidarity is uh, aimed at at being inclusive, but also fairly institutionalized in a sense that they yeah they really try to ensure the livelihood for all of the locals that they can and need it, and when they make decisions on on employment. They uh, aim. They make the decision based on the people's needs and the vulnerability, and not based on uh, skills. Like let's employ the ones who, who have the most skills. So that's not that's let, that's not what they prioritize necessarily, uh, and especially on on stable jobs. And therefore, uh, yeah, they are very inclusive in their locality. But then again, uh, the German CSA uh, uh, is uh, acting very differently. They are kind of uh, critical towards this kind of institution, uh, these, these uh, state institutions, and therefore they don't have any formal, even formal employment forms. But they kind of include everybody who comes as a volunteer into the informal family economy, in a sense that all volunteers get a place of say, they get a share of food, and those who commit to work on a farm along, on a longer term, they also kind of their healthcare is taken care for, and they, yeah, their basic needs are taken care for. Uh, so this, fam this German CSA is kind of a fairly radically uh, uh, taking a step beyond, yeah, counting the the hours against which your needs are being served and saying it's a they are kind of both of free gift of free will and everybody who works here or contributes is is allowed to be taken being taken care of. But uh, this of course is fairly exclusive, even though it's more radical because it really needs that people commit to this community and to this farm. And um, yeah, what the final example is then, which is in, indeed a bit different in this case, is this uh, ecotourism example, but I will then uh, come back to that and in the conclusion and give the next word to Anya about uh, eco ecological practices. Sorry, how many, how many minutes do we have? Um, you, you could go up to uh, three o'clock if you want three or five but then that leaves okay. 10 minutes for discussion so up to you okay. as you want to so we'll aim to kind of move to the next paper by uh, 15 past three so up to okay. you how you want to manage that time great thank you 
Okay, and so the final uh, collaborative practice that we analyzed was a uh, practice of nature regeneration. And um, uh, for example, um, diver uh, very diverse uh, farming uh, practices which integrate food production, but at the same time, um, soil regeneration um, that is done through agroforestry different, uh, and different other techniques of farming. And uh, we noticed that the collaborative practices in various forms and degrees spread in these organizations often to both human and non-human participants, inclu including non-human nature as an active participant, which requires considering allocation of time and resources for slow processes of nature restoration um, in farming, besides the, uh, the practices of food production. Uh, however, the natural cycles are slow and the time and effort implied in uh, collaboration with nature may be at odds with the short-term material stability. Uh, for example, in case of uh, users co-op, there are spaces allocated to production, uh, while at the same time many spaces are undergoing the reforest uh, re reforestation uh, processes for soil regeneration. Uh, thus, we see the processes of negotiation in these cases between production and conservation processes in farming cases. And in the case of ecotourism, this negotiation is rather uh, between nature conservation and inclusiveness, uh, because the spaces uh, which are allocated for nature restoration um, to, to a degree lead to eviction of people who used these spaces before, for example, for uh, camping. Uh, Suna? Yeah, so now I would like to uh, sum up and uh, conclude uh, more or less the, um, um, yeah, the presentation. So indeed, like our, um, yeah, so also as a background for you, we, uh, we do, did not really start or come from cooperative studies, but we were then um, uh, had a chance to publish in the, in the upcoming special issue. So we kind of started to reflect uh, how, um, yeah, how, how does our, how do our results relate to the, let's say, differences between these different organizational forms that we have. And uh, yeah, and our initial interest was indeed to observe how is it, how is it possible to, at the same time, ensure the organizational stability and, and then uh, achieve this kind of different, uh, very different, so yeah, serve these different kind of stakeholders or interests and, and these different values that the um, co-ops co 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 are working with and the different collaborations to bring together because it's indeed a challenging coordination act. And what we uh, uh, concluded is that uh, um, like they do all they have survived they have also survived through a corona uh, pandemic and uh, yeah already through a startup phase as we mentioned um yeah and continue to work despite uh, also major conflicts that many of them have had on the way or also despite uh, in at least in some cases continuous precarity and, and small income which is um, yeah so maybe the question is rather whether whether there's major risk of, of, of collapsing or, for example, but rather what kind of compromises one has to make and who, yeah, or well, what kind of values are maybe perhaps not served the best possible uh, when, when kind of covering up for some ways of instability in the process. And one example, what Anja just mentioned, is this ecotourism example where they, uh, in favor of uh, making, like building up a, a example of a degrowth business, like changing from mass tourism to degrowth, they then also, um, and yeah, in favor for, um, uh, or in process of favoring uh, space for nature, space for animals, uh, they then have also started a gentrification process and excluded human users out of the space who did not then kind of respect the values that they had. So that's, um, um, yeah, also a critical uh, point for sure. Um, yeah, indeed. Uh, the second interesting issue is that uh, across all of these forms, uh, about, about what it seems to kind of bring out to the discussion of, of collaboration uh, and kind of new cooperatism is indeed the inclusion of, of, of yeah, of nature, of, of non-human participants and like 
considering them as yeah, not just as an object, not just as something, as a resource that you need to take care of, but as uh, uh, active participants that you have to work with because, uh, yeah, you cannot, uh, other, if you don't attend to the nature, you don't learn how it works and, yeah, you have to work with them instead of uh, using it. So that's that's kind of an interesting approach to include into the, the uh, stakeholder uh, thought. Then, um, yeah, indeed, uh, what we also uh, observed that these collaborative practices, they were not limited to, uh, even though they were perhaps the most strongest uh, in the cooperative forms, they were certainly not limited to them. Um, and yeah, and already what Anja was talking about, that um, that it's, uh, there are many many more factors that have influenced on or, or maybe might explain the the, the ability to, to for diverse collaboration, which is also the, uh, yeah, the institutional, uh, uh, infrastructural location, like whether they are close to the city, whether they already have a lot of resources and, and with which they are able to employ a lot of people to coordinate these kind of practices. So they're, they're the, the small family enterprises in very precarious locations simply lack the capacities often for hosting these processes. And finally, what we do also notice that for these individual enterprises of like uh, non-cooperative forms, networks are especially important as kind of an intermediary structure of bringing new inputs, uh, yeah, critical lessons, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, which help the entrepreneurs to to yeah develop their businesses and and so on. Um, yeah, and when preparing this presentation, I was also reading for the literature and kind of a about this idea of Michael, uh, excuse me, oh, I'm um, missing the, the final, uh, uh, the, real, the, fi the complete quote here, but Bowens and Pansat is about online commons and about the idea that this, uh, this uh, open collaboration could be protected by uh, foundations and this kind of a new infrastructures who offer, offer funding and offer lobby so that the individual cooperators can focus on the actual work. So this seems to work on online world, but here in the world of primary production, it seems to be much more difficult because these infrastructures exist already and they are, you know, the lobby organizations for, for conventional agriculture are very strong. Mm. And then the networks for these new innovative organizations are really are fairly weak, they lack funding and uh, also, and of, of course the, uh, um, the individual farmers lack the capacities to really contribute to these networks. So there would be a major need of development so that also these individual uh, innovative initiatives would have a collective force and collective, uh, let's say, a position. And this, they, they might also be the ones to really uh, position them in the institutional field and in the legislation, because often these individual initiatives, even though they make, they are really, let's say, ambitious in ethical terms, but they are too small in themselves in order to really convince the politics that this might be the right, re right way to, to go on when considering the future of, of uh, rural livelihoods. Yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm finished for my side. And uh, if Anya, you want to still add something at the end, go ahead. And then we're open for discussion. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I have nothing to add. Please, if you have any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anna and Suna, for your, for your paper. Very interesting. Um, um, the floor is open for questions and comments. Adrian has posted already a question, or, yeah, question in the in the chat. Um, uh, I can see Rory uh, wanting to, uh, to to say something. Uh, should we start with Rory, and perhaps then uh, we can take the question in the chat? Uh, I think I think Adrian got there before me. Oh, did it? Sorry, yeah. I wasn't quite okay. So. Um, for everyone's benefit, on the benefit of the recording, um, Adrian is uh, um, asking if you could please say something about land ownership and what form this takes to support eco-social objectives in your cases. Seems to me that land is often a key limitation for rural social entrepreneurship. Anya, you want to go for that? or? Sure. Yeah, I can start. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Yeah, we have uh, different um, um, land ownership forms in the in the sample, um, and one, actually one case does not um, have land. It's, it is not land based. Um, 
the in this this uh, not land based case it's also kind of interesting because uh it's it's a, a, a cooperative that uh, uh, mostly aims to uh, provide solidarity economy channels to the local farmers and uh, they are trying to work with the farmers who already have small uh, or bigger patches of land and they are uh, trying to work with them so that they change the production to organic and more envir environmental uh, processes. Then, then, the, then we have a, a big kind of um, land, um, which is a cooperative and it used to be a, first it was a traditional cooperative, then it was a private ownership and now it transitioned again to a, a cooperative basically. Uh, so, so it is a pretty big piece of land and uh, uh, that's the main idea kind of to, uh, in a way, give this land to the local village. So it is done through um, hiring more people and making them a part of the of the cooperative. Um, Suna? Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, indeed, uh, but also in this case, I mean, the, actually the land is still belongs mostly to the owner and only a small part of it is belongs to the cooperative. So it's a name, but it's not really, the land is not really collectivized. Mm -hmm. But it also, I mean, uh, it really depends on the national context, I think. It's a, yeah. um, also working with the Danish uh, cases, so which, which are not part of this paper, and um, si since it is a small country and uh, pretty expensive country, it's very difficult to buy uh, for, for young farmers, for people who want to start ecological practices, it's difficult to buy land, but for example, in some other parts, for example, the part of Portugal where we were working um, in the more remote parts, it's a lot cheaper. So sometimes it's not land uh, is not really the main problem. The problem is uh, that people don't want to go so far away into the rural areas. So um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, I, and um, yeah, it's either for individual initiatives. It's you often land is the issue, uh, except probably in those uh, perhaps not so much in the rural Portugal. Or then it's if you want to scale up the practices and scale up the, the principles, as in the case of the cooperative without land, then it's the issue of how to convince those other farmers or other actors who have the land to, to work with you and transform their practices. So it's kind of both. Should I get my question in before the drilling starts again? If I if I've got some housework going on here. Um, thank you. That was, that was, it was interesting. I was interested towards the end it's you seem to be elaborating a view of new cooperativism that it involves collaboration with the environment so is that that i've, I've interpreted that correctly yes okay um the other thing that caught my eye and i wondered if this this is really my my question i guess is you mentioned that although there was more economic solidarity in the cooperatives, the user and the producer co-ops, which I, I guess is logical, you, you said that families started collaborating. So I wondered if, in a sense, families were creating an informal cooperative association, like a secondary co-op. Um, maybe you don't, didn't call it that or recognise it that, but can you tell us a little bit more about the collaboration between the family businesses and whether that might be an enterprise co-op? or a, a potential um, enterprise co-op yeah maybe i asked that because that's what i've been researching more okay uh, I mean, except i know if you know some some examples from denmark and you can surely share um i mean i think i don't know the literature or the examples of the secondary corps enough so that i could really now compare yeah these are the the, the ways to recognize secondary corp or define it and that it fits there but um well, uh, well, let's you, you mentioned the family businesses started sh sharing, you know, marketing efforts, sharing transport mm -hmm. efforts. So yeah, was, yeah. That, was that a formal association or was it just informal? Mo I mean, mostly very informal. Like the very most that happened was kind of spontaneous. Okay, there is a, uh, there, like when a big order was coming and uh, one farmer noticed, okay, I don't have all of these uh, or my neighbor might profit from this as well. So they called each other and said, okay, you, you have some herbs of this and this type we can uh, do this uh, risk to yeah respond to this order together 
and indeed and in these export relations it was also uh, i actually i didn't um, i didn't explicitly ask what what how are the contracts like but how they explained it is that they negotiate and it's like a very really, uh, let's say friendly relationship where they then handle and look at okay what do you need and what do i need um so so it's a kind but, of and then there were, yeah, kind of mostly informal. And there was one mm. formal collaboration. So some of the family farms really put up together an association, I think. But uh, this didn't work out. So at the end, they, right. uh, and, and the, the, the main, let's say, discourse amongst the family farmers, they were all the time discussing, should we put up a cooperative, should we formalize so that we could more efficiently cooperate? And they all, all the time, they came up to the conclusion that it's uh, nobody really wants to do the management. Nobody has the time for that. It doesn't make sense. It's too it's too complicated to do a formal cooperation so let's say informal and so it's yeah uh, it's kind of interesting interesting discussion concerning what what's how was yeah, the I benefits mean, and benefits of the just, yeah. just 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 by way of feedback to finish off i mean i, I mentioned yesterday i was reading a, a phd about african co-ops mm. and they talk about the size of the informal economy there so there, mm. there are formalized co-ops but about 90 percent of people they say are in the informal economy and the one thing about the social solidarity economy concept is that it embraces the informal cooperative mm. rather than just the formal cooperative. Mm. So um, they were supportive of, of, of the usage of that language to recognize informal cooperation and indeed for informal co-ops that are actually quite well organized. Mm. Uh, they're just not on paper or in law. Yeah. yeah. Right. Can I add a little bit to this, just a little? Um, that uh, I think that um, this really represents this uh, this different this difference and uh, um, the, the the different formats of the rural uh, collaboration because um, um, there are also many examples of um, kind of small farmers or small initiatives that um, unite in unofficial networks and I, I guess the the this herbal farm can be considered a part of uh, of the network um, and uh, yeah and the relations of solidarity sh sharing the input sharing knowledge mm -hmm. uh, sharing spaces just to uh, you know, know each other they all they develop in these networks also um, so yeah, it's it's an interesting question. What is better, in a way, uh, for these eco ec ecological purposes, eco social, innovative purposes in rural areas, the kind of formal um, cooperatives that also share the the space, or these unofficial networks, which maybe are more reinforced by online internet um, uh, connections. So I think that's an interesting question. Any further comments or questions from the floor? Um, I can't see any. In this case, may I please ask very quickly? Oh, Elizabeth, go ahead. Uh, I can I can perhaps chat to Anna and soon in the break. It's not really a question. Maybe um, I was really interested in uh, the clash, let's say, between new and old, which I guess it was very apparent in uh, the case, in your case, and rural approaches, newer, you know, younger generations to all more conventional approaches uh, <clears throat> to farming, etc. So, if you have any examples or in, in, in your mind from uh, the study about how did the, what kind of collaborative practices work better in trying to kind of mitigate this clash between uh, the new and the old kind of uh, approaches? Uh, because you talked about turbulences and compromises and a learning process. And I see that all the time in all different types of properties, having this clash happening and different ways of trying to, to overcome it. So that, was there something successful there with a success story that we can take mm -hmm. should I answer um thanks thank you for the question yeah the, the this um, dichotomies between old and new are very present I think in all these uh, rural innovation entrepreneur and entrepreneurship processes and, and it's between the 
the people of different generations, between different ideas, between uh, old structures and new movements. And uh, yeah, as, as I was explaining, like, yeah, the, the, the case where probably the, the, there was most diversity and, and collaboration was this uh, bigger um, user scope. And um, I guess what, what, wh why it works uh, probably is that there is this uh, focus on uh, the needs of people, what different groups of people need. Uh, for example, the, the local population, the local workers, they need meaningful and stable employment. So this is kind of provided for them. Um, the, 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 the young people can maybe be more precarious in terms of uh, working contracts, can sometimes be volunteers if there is no not enough resources, but they are very interested in uh, uh, ecological processes and uh, contributing to, to that. So in that sense, it's, uh, you know, balancing what, what people need and, uh, uh, yeah, trying to organize it in that sense. Yeah, I can give another example. It's like, I think it's kind of showing, like showing respect towards the different types of work and different, I think that's in, in many ways came came to like trying to work, work away from the arrogance that I, I know better and why, what, I, what are you doing there? But and, and one example is that in the in the bigger cooperative, the one young uh, educated person who is res irresponsible for the sociocratic process, for the decision making process, he's also a farmer. And he says, hey, when everybody sees that I'm also sweating and working here on the fields, he gains then much more respect from the other like hands on workers who then sees that he's kind of a more like them and not just standing up and trying to say that I know how you should make your decisions uh, and I have no idea about your real reality. And the same in, in even in the um, uh, tourism case, uh, even though the relationship to the customers was uh, not so respectful, but towards the workers, they, for example, realized that one of the elderly workers was really handy with making her own soaps and has already like in her home a lot of knowledge about ecological detergents, but she just was skeptical that it works on an, an in industrial or on a professional level. So that's where they came together and then leaders kind of were showed interest on her experience on that. And then she kind of felt that, okay, oh, I'm, I'm actually, I, she didn't, didn't even know that she's um, kind of ecological pioneer and that's how they also found together. Right, I think it's about time to move to the next paper, Colin. So uh, let's uh, thank one more Anna and Suna for their contribution to, to this afternoon and, and our conference. Very well done. Um, the next speakers are um, Hao Dong and Adrian Bailey, who will be presenting a paper entitled Collaborative Post-Crisis Rural Projects with Agility, an Empirical Study of Agricultural Cooperatives in China. Um, hello, hi. Um, I think um, I'll try to share my screen first. Uh, um, can you see it? Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, um, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And first of all, I want to express my gratitude for this opportunity and thank you all for joining this session. Uh, my name is Hao and I just got started on my academic career uh, as a lecturer in operations and project management at the University of Southampton. So this, this one, this ongoing study I'm going to present today uh, looks at a co-op from a project management perspective. Uh, more specifically with Adrian and uh, Prof Professor Baker, we look at the post-crisis projects that co-ops are involved in and uh, um, how what we call agility or agile projects are successfully realized through cooperative way of organizing. Um, as the unit of study of this research are co-op projects in mainland China, where the context is that there are not many other types of co-ops apart from the specialized agricultural co-ops or farmers specialized co-ops, that's what they call it. Uh, so for this presentation, I may use the terms rural and agriculture interchangeably because that's just a co-op you can find in China. Um, uh, some personal background that I would like to introduce as well is uh, my interest in co-op started in my third year of 
University, inspired by Adrian's cooperative module at Exeter. And then he supervised and supported me through a PhD on contemporary Chinese co-op and sustainable tea supplies. Um, after which, as an intersection with my duties at Southampton, I noticed there's this um, thirst and opportunity of thinking about co-op and their role from a more project management perspective. Um, I'm sure the audience here today are all experts and masters of co-op studies. Um, I've learned quite a lot in the two days so far, and we hope our perspective and reflections would appear interesting. And I'm sure your comments will be very inspiring. Thanks in advance. Uh, as scheduled by the conference chair, we'll have a Q&A session or more of a discussion at the end of this presentation, but please do give a shout during, during me talking if your question cannot wait. Um, there's a lot I want to share, but I may have to leave some to the discussion section, including some definition, uh, defining terms like what is agile projects, what is agility, if anyone's interested, uh, because that's less relevant to this group, uh, I believe. As said, recently we've been putting our effort onto the interdisciplinary area of co-op and agriculture projects. We delivered a presentation at this year's BAM conference, uh, the British Academy of Management, which was like two weeks ago or so, um, on their, for their project management track. Uh, when speaking with them, I started with this slide because many of the people out there don't have a clue what a co-op is. Uh, so potentially they may shop their groceries from the co-op food very frequently. Uh, for this group of audience, however, this wouldn't be necessary, maybe even be silly to do. Uh, but I kept it here as a reminder because one of our aims uh, for this study is to attract attention from the operational management community. Uh, personally, I believe we need fresh pairs of eyes and support from non co community to develop and further promote uh, cooperativism. Uh, this is also how we position this piece of study. So roughly, this is why we believe this research is demanded from a co-op study perspective. And on the other hand, from a more project management perspective, there is also a pressing need as well. So uh, first, I think we need to look at what is an agricultural project or rural project, uh, because even within the the project community, the majority of experienced project man management scholars know very little about projects in agriculture settings. Mm -hmm. um, in such context, I'll, ex I'll explain why a bit later, but in such contexts, here I quote, a project is a unique operation to modify the means of production from an individual farmer constructing a large new diary unit to a government department uh, executing large scale conservation works, or even to a project in which the major items are administrative rather than physical, such as the uh, reorganization of part of the state's agricultural services. So um, agriculture projects are important. Uh, this is not only because uh, we all are food, good food for sure, but more importantly, more than that, there's, this project affects the welfare of over half of the world's population. Uh, those inhabited in rural areas. And also they directly affect the sustainability of many natural resources and biodiversity. Um, the scale and enormous impact of agriculture projects means they are vital in achieving social, environmental and economic sustainability, which are often goals for many cooperatives, as well as um, these are recognized as a key component in the UN SDG. But, uh, different from more traditional projects, like those found in engineering or construction, agricultural projects are often delivered through alternative forms of organizations, including our favorite cooperatives and the community enterprises, governments and NGOs. Um, there is this present need to understand these projects, especially considering that the COVID pandemic has caused major disruptions and severe challenges uh, particularly for many of the rural population in developing economies who are often at a worse off situation because they simply cannot work from home and get paid. Um, however, with that said, agricultural projects are noticeably under-researched. Um, this is supported by extensive reviews across major journals of project research, 
namely the uh, IGPM, International Journal of Project Management, and the PMJ, Project Management Journal. Uh, the main reason for this, as literature suggests, is because of the nature of dispersion and the disparity of the stakeholders of agricultural projects. Uh, this is where many project scholars got stuck. But for us, by looking at the co-op, we can overcome much of this difficulty. Um, um, this group would know and agree on the importance of achieving sustainable development through co-ops as they offer a proven valid alternative team form to temporarily organize uh, individual rural businesses and their projects. Uh, this, as suggested in Baker et al. 2016 work in organization studies, captures the uh, activities and the practices associated with collectives of independent individuals or corporate actors who pursue ex ante agreed upon task objectives within a um, predetermined time frame. And plus, the idea of agile project management itself is new and emerging. The specific term of agile projects has only been around for about 20 years. And our own recent systematic literature review funded by um, the Association for Project Management in the UK shows that there are only dozens of academic literature on this topic, not agile in agriculture topic, but agile in project management, all this very, very limited literature. So we think there's a great gap we can, we can fill and make our contribution. So the, the next question is why China? Why COP in China? Um, obviously because I speak Chinese, so it's either for me, but more than that, um, according to, to the World Bank, surprisingly, well, I, I, say, I say surprisingly, actually as someone from that part of the world, it's not that surprising for me personally, but anyway, surprisingly as the second largest economy of the globe, there are 340 million Chinese living in poverty by the standard of less than 5.5 US dollar a day. Some may say that's already much far above the extreme poverty line. I agree, but these people are often overlooked and there's the fact that among the highest taxation regions, you got very little social welfare and the living costs are quite high in China. Um, a, a quick personal story, Adrian and I went to Shanghai in 2017, where um, you can find it costs as much as you were living in London or New York. And uh, if you take a drive two hours out of the town, you're in a totally different world. And I would say with my, I've been in England for 12 years, with my current pay, I can't afford a similar living standard in Shanghai or Beijing. But anyway, so I recall a couple of months ago, uh, the prime minister of China revealed that some 600 million Chinese have a monthly disposable income per capita of no more than 1,000 Chinese yuan, which equals to around 110 pounds sterling per month. Uh, and based on my experience with the farmers, those who can earn this much, they are already they are already probably the middle class in rural China. So um, the economic inequality and poverty have been a long lasting issue in China. Since the 1990s, a term named Sunnong was um, proposed by scholars, which marks notice of such issue and the continuing efforts to address it. Uh, this term indicates three dimensions, uh, farming population, rural community and agriculture production. All three words in Chinese, they, they share the same character known in the language. And obviously that means three in English, you all know that. Uh, the emerging and fast spreading of modern agricultural co-ops in China is considered a response to address these issues uh, and, uh, is, um, and has been promoted by and supportive policies. The core projects are believed to be an alternative method beyond state socialist and capitalist modes of agriculture and rural development. Under the favorable policy and the subsidies, the number of uh, agricultural co-ops in China increased sharply in the past 15 years, as can be seen on the graph. Um, Around early 2000s, regional legis legislators and policymakers in one province next to Shanghai started to support the development of agricultural co-ops. 
Then in 2007, the first national co-op law went into action, um, which was amended uh, 10 years later. Uh, during the same period, the number of registered cooperatives in China grew sharply from 150,000 in 2004 to uh, uh, engaging 24 million households, uh, which is, was about 10% of the total rural households in China, to over 2.2 million co-ops in 2019, covering half of the country's agricultural population, um, according to data from Ministry of Agriculture of China. Uh, so for China, co-op is a new and emerging topic, uh, and it's about a new and emerging phenomena. Um, there are gaps and potential to be fulfilled, which especially requires high quality international collaborative works. That's why we want to bring this to this conference. I can already sense um, there are questions around this. Um, earlier this afternoon, Peter briefly touched on this, but about this. <laughs> Yes, there is often this inter interpretation when you see something tagged made in China, you, you, you're going to question if it's authentic. Um, I partially agree with Peter that um, the corps must be understood within the context and culture, but I actually think Peter was too nice about calling what's happening in China is just a result of the cultural difference. Um, I can explain further later, and um, I have another piece of work with Adrian trying to set up typologies, how to rule out those uh, fake co-ops. And uh, yeah, I, I would, uh, if anyone come in now saying, oh, most of them are fake, I, so the conclusion is that I agree with that. Uh, <laughs> I also got an interesting story from another case study of ours about the co-ops embeddedness through kinship. Uh, which involves theft and forgiveness, but we will see how the time goes on this one. So there are numerous agricultural cooperatives in China, uh, and yes, their legitimacy as sustainable alternatives to investor-owned um, organizations have been called into question. Um, as the regulation, the, the 2007 one, and there's another re revised version, which was just out two or three years ago. So the national record corp regulations almost permit fake corps because they don't represent much of uh, the ICA standards uh, in the law itself. And uh, in practice, the practice are even uh, far worse than what's in the um, legal document. But um, so these fake corps in China, they deliver very few social benefits and uh, there's lots of studies on that. Would that this kind of um, phenomena result in different performance of project delivery? This is particularly important considering that many critiques are saying 90% 90, 90 of them are fake, they're not authentic cops, and they did poor in fulfilling their due identity as both economic and social enterprises. So this is an important background information as we are looking at uh, not only business projects. And this is what we uh, we are set to find out through a study. And uh, this paper is a qualitative piece of work. Uh, the study seeks to address the gap in extent project management literature by adopting an interdisciplinary research approach to investigate agriculture projects uh, that's carried out by co-ops or at least involving co-ops uh, as part of the inter-organizational project team. We want to explore the paradigm of project management with agility in the agriculture sector and how sustainability is achieved through agriculture cooperatives in contrast to traditional organizations. We aim to understand the agile project, project practice and the underpinning institutional arrangements of the cooperatives, which as value-based organizations are considered successful in delivering both commodity products or services and associated unique characters of their social, environmental, and long-term economic sustainability as their project uh, deliverables um, uh, against, especially against the uh, disruptive crisis. So here is a question we attempt to answer, and we want to answer it for both the farmers and their stakeholders. So um, we know co-ops play a significant role at a global scale. We know co-ops are delivering their projects and have been making good contribution. Many, many of them have been making very good contribution 
to poverty elevation and inclusive development. But there are just not enough research, not from a operational project management perspective. And we are positioning this study as part of long-term research series. We found that uh, cooperatives as value-based organizations, uh, many of, uh, of the co-op values and the structure appear to be much uh, um, uh, compliable, is that the correct word? <laughs> much competent to, uh, to the agile way of project management, uh, such as self-organizing autonomy and the democratic control. So the corps intrinsic characters, um, the first, second, and fourth ISA principles are solidly um, set the cornerstones, which uh, enable the corps and the corp members to become uh, to form an agile organization with a key feature of agility, which are um, flexibility, adaptability, and respons responsiveness when delivering their projects. And corp managers are in fact, in our view, uh, they are in fact agile project managers um, or the boundary spanners who coordinating between and among his or her teams, member farmers and the outside stakeholders. Um, then, uh, as we are still at the early stage of, of this study, I want to talk a bit about the boring academic side of, um, of stuff. So to form a solid foundation to start with, we have conduct, conducted literature reviews and pilots and scoping studies. Uh, uh, so the, the reviews covered both the COPs in China and the COPs uh, agile project management. Uh, systematic literature reviews were um, for the COP were conducted through English literature databases. And because this is a study at looking at Chinese COPs, we also looked at uh, academic and great literature written in local language. Uh, for which we adopted a Delphi method, just because there isn't a good enough database there that's accessible. And this research has also received much support from our peer academics and other groups of stakeholders from the country, including lo local authorities and the policymakers. Then about and data collection, we adopt a multiple case study approach. Uh, specifically, we selected three co-ops um, from different regions in mainland China, with relevant project experience and sustainability achievement against uh, disruptive conditions, including natural disasters, flood, um, market disruptions, and uh, cyclical pandemics, um, where they showcase their agility. So with primary data from interviews with a wide range of stakeholders, including rural entrepreneurs, farmers, scholars, uh, policymakers, a multinational corporation executives in the supply chain, in the same food supply chain, the corps are sitting in, and other stakeholders associated. We seek to examine the underrepresented project management practice across agri corps in China and to identify their common and uh, possibly distinctive experience in enhancing agility and other corp uh, organizational process. So two rounds of data collection have already been undertaken. Um, so building on the transcriptions and translations of the interview data so far, uh, we are planning for a third field visiting uh, to capture additional data, which has become essentially, uh, especially relevant uh, due to the development of COVID-19. And uh, we also kept additional unstructured interviews and uh, observations uh, to form triangulation um, to assist our analysis. So to get a clear, more holistic, picture of how corps are delivering their projects better than their rivals. We adopt a more institutional perspective to trying to explain how and why the corp organizations are suitable and to uh, explain how individuals and organization, organizational actions as powerful sources of change, which in turn affect uh, the performance of their project delivery. Uh, uh, this, this group of audience must know institutional theories have been applied to research into agri crops, uh, emphasizing the importance of new institutional arrangements and organizational structures, but mainly on um, um, crops in the EU and in America. There's less, there's fewer studies about crops in China. So uh, we adopt and develop a cross level model, which can be 
um, we, we, which I, I, I included a photo of that at the end of the presentation. If anyone's interested, we can we can have a look at that together. And uh, yeah, we will need and appreciate uh, to this expert audience group suggestions. The uh, the next steps the um, this developmental paper is that it's uh, so this paper is at the developmental stage and uh, together with several other pieces towards the same direction, uh, we think it has taken, well, it has taken a few years to develop and um, we feel like we've got some really good attention and positive feedback from project professions and from um, agriculture uh, experts, scholars. It's a great honor to have this paper accepted by UKSCS this year. Um, and also, as mentioned, we also had another piece received very well reception at the BAM 2021 project uh, track. Naturally, the next steps would be us to finish the third round data collection and then uh, analysis to see how the uh, development of COVID-19 has impact, impacted on this co-op so far. But um, we will see if the travel bans and uh, <laughs> other restrictions will be lifted soon. Uh, our vision for this paper is to offer solid and meaningful um, interdisciplinary results for both understanding agriculture co-ops and the contemporary project management to be incorporated into future um, research, maybe even statistical or modeling research. Um, and uh, this can go beyond. Some, some of you must already know that Agile, pro well, some of you might know that Agile projects have been proven great for technology and IT contexts because that's where Agile emerged 20 years ago. So we expect, we expect good future application of this research will, um, can be applied with those new online platform co-ops and uh, projects of co-ops in other sectors. So this is roughly my 20 minutes, if I'm reading the clock correctly. Uh, thank you. And at this stage of development, I wish I could have shared more. Uh, so any comments would be truly welcomed. Um, or if anyone want to talk about related issues beyond what I just showed in my slides, say the authenticity of corps in China, how to deal with it, or our um, Adrian and my uh, Adrian and my institutional typologies we are developing to identify fake corps in China, which really is the foundation we build on to do this work. Because as you cannot understand or improve the situation without knowing clearly what the situation is, so yeah, I'm sure Adrian and I are more than happy to talk about those as well. Um, oh, uh, and also uh, in the context of China, um, there's some. Um, in, with the recent political development, we I recently kind of have a fear that maybe some people, some group want to use the name of the COP to, because most of the fake COPs we mentioned earlier in China, they are more or less like investor owned business just with the COP name. But there's also this newly developed trend where people are discussing kind of in favor of communes and uh, the old marketing and the supply corps, which it seems quite scary um, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so if, if there's any discussion, if, any questions you have uh, around that, we can also um, have some chat. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Hao, for uh, presenting your paper and for sharing uh, uh, these insights. Uh, very much appreciated. I can see some colleagues with their hands raised already. Um, I think uh, we've got Suna, Anna, Rory at the moment. So, um, Hannah, keep her hand down. So, Suna, shall we start with Suna? Uh, Rory was first, so maybe you can go. You're muted, Rory. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I, I mean, I was interested in the, I'm interested in uh, how you determine a, a co-op is fake. So what, what criteria do you apply to um, determine that a co-op is fake? And, and, and secondly, if it's not a co-op, what is it? <laughs> uh, 
uh, let me answer the second question first. <laughs> um, so uh, from my experience with, with the farmers and, and we did some comparative analysis with co-op named organizations in, in, in the same region. Uh, most of the fake co-ops, they are just uh, investor owned uh, um, business, rural business, but they are, I wouldn't call them really like large evil corporations. They are just rural small business, but they are at a larger scale comparing to the co-op farmers. Um, and many of them name themselves co-ops because since early or late 2000s, there's lots of subsidies that are available for co-ops. So if you register as a co-op, and the registration criteria were not really clear, mm -hmm. and there's lots of, um, if you're, you're a friend with lo local offices, they'll just approve your application. So there's lots of those things going on. So that's what's the, you know. Um, but interestingly, um, there was a period, say about five years ago, there was uh, rumors that the Chinese government would want to support what they call family farms. So they want to say, okay, we know to an extent many of the money set out for co-ops actually went, in, went into the pockets of um, investor-owned agriculture companies. Less just subsidies of farmers. And uh, you can also say there are farmers um, that have the small farms with multiple sites and titles in the area. Agri company. We are a co-op. At the same time, we are individual uh, family farm. So, yeah. So it's, it's, so, the, it's the lack of democracy amongst participating members that is the criterion for, for labeling a co-op a fake co-op. I remember, this, uh, I remember this in Indonesia as well, that there were like the co-ops of the military and co-ops of the police, which they, they basically just formed co-ops with their own money, but then employed other people and they weren't actually participating. Yeah, so there are, there are co-ops like those as well. And the many co-ops there is basically just uh, farmers serve as outside uh, what they call them members. Some of the members don't even know they are members. They just list their names. And they, they, they are practically functioning as external suppliers to where the business buy their products from, or um, they are like employees. But um, yeah, well, uh, back to your first question. Okay. We have something like this, which we developed from a model, multi level model. Um, we uh, look at right. macro yes. and micro. Uh, conflicting pressures, how that um, affect yeah. in, uh, pe people's behavior and the institutional pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we somehow, uh, Adrian and I tried to, 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 to change it a little bit. We develop it into, we add the organizational level because we think co-ops uh, are functioning at the middle level between the members and the external uh, environment. And also we replaced the, um, three types of institutional pressures, the, the cognitive, normative, and the regulative uh, pressures with something we identified from the um, both ISA principles and the requirements in the Chinese corp law, where, because in the law they talk about, ban roughly, they talk about membership benefits and membership control. They don't really talk, talk, talk about education or, or community concerns, that's not there yet. Um, so yeah, so 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 this this is a, the, the the typology and my personal view is like at the current stage, if he, if I'm putting <laughs> I shouldn't say that if I can decide who which is real cop, which is not, who should get subsidies, who should not, I'll use the two typologies at the same time. So at least you need to hit a high level in either of the criteria in either of the typologies if you cannot show you're doing, you're achieving anything in either of the typologies, and you're just a traditional agriculture business. Don't say you're a call. And this is also a um, discussion many of the, the Chinese group of scholars on co-ops are having, uh, which I observe some would just say, oh, let's just all call them co-ops. These are just poor farmers. If they say they're co-ops, we consider them co-ops, let's give them money. And uh, there's another, more critical groups in saying you have to set the rules clear, who's cop, who's not. And also 
uh, if you don't have the clear rules, uh, it will just turn out running by um, people who have better connections with people who's handling the money, which is uh, unfair uh, competing uh, disadvantages. So, yeah. Let, let Anna and Suna ask the questions now, I think. Suna, would you like to go first? Um, yeah, my question goes very much in the direction of the discussion, and it, I've made perhaps a lot of was already cleared. Yeah, so I was indeed wondering that if um, if there are uh, these uh, cooperatives, I mean, there seems to be a large number of cooperatives that don't really resemble the the value and ideal of agile management that you are, would be looking for. So I was interested in how do you choose your case studies? How do you choose the, because if I understood right, you are doing kind of qualitative research. So how do you go about, yeah, are you looking at just any kind of cooperatives and they might be kind of fake or not, or are you already by case study selection trying to find out a pool which might be more truly practicing this kind of a cooperative values? And how do you find them? Yeah, so, um, okay. So, so, so the topology we have, that's from a previous, previous study. So when we select the cases, uh, there's um, basically two criteria. One is, uh, um, as mentioned er earlier in, 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 the, in my presentation, we want those are doing well, and they have some successful experience in delivering uh, projects under um, disruptive or crisis uh, conditions. And the second, yes, we, 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 we applied our own typologies. So you have to be at least doing something outstanding. You don't have to be great in every aspect, but you have to do at least one area outstanding better than uh, traditional companies to, to, to be considered as a core. Maybe they don't fulfill all seven of the ICA principles, but at least you need to show something different. That's basically our um, sampling strategy in a nutshell. Thank you. I, I hope that's an uh, answer you like or you... Um... <laughs> Yeah, 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 sure, thank you. Anna, would you like to ask your question now? Yeah, thank you. Um, very interesting. Uh, I think that this uh, raises very interesting topics in a way. Um, the fake cooperatives, but uh, also I was thinking about the, the use of social enterprise, the term social enterprise by uh, companies and I think that there are uh, different sides also in this uh, uh, discussion. Um, for example, companies that uh, that are mostly for, for profit and they kind of use the social enterprise or maybe cooperative for marketing pur uh, purposes because the, the names, the terms, they imply more social responsibility. So it might attract uh, more consumers and just give them more visibility to the organizations but at the same time also there are organizations very small uh, emerging initiatives that are thinking about what kind of organizational structure to take uh, because it might give them support to uh, you know some some organizational support and, and uh, maybe, as you mentioned, that the cooperatives uh, get more funding. So if it's a cooperative that's more beneficial uh, or the association or uh, for profit. So I think that's a, yeah, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting topic that has kind of different dimensions to it. Uh, and yeah, that was not a question, just a comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, about, I do want to say, um... So reflected on what I found when I was out there, um, in a way, I think, uh, you know, we're com Chinese com communism country, people don't really, um, the farmers, they are in a way more practical. They don't care, many of, most of them don't care what you call them. They don't, um, there's, you can say there's a lack of um, concern for community just because I would say most of them are just worried um, enough about their own well-being. So, and some, a small portion of them are still scared by the memory of um, the communes from um, or supply or 
marketing and the supply corps, supply and marketing corps from the 50s and 60s where people suffered. So actually the, the farmers themselves don't know much about cooperativism or they, I wonder if they care that much. And from the, it's a divided society in a way. I don't think the customers care too much about whether this is a fair, fair trade or the farmers get a fair portion. I think the major concerns for the consumers are more are still more on the safety issues of the food, which is, um, yeah, <laughs> that's my um, reflection. <laughs> which is sad, but I think that's where really the situation is stuck still in, in 2021. Thanks, Hal, for this, for this uh, response. Um, Suna, is that a new hand or an old hand up? So, sorry, I forgot to take it down. <laughs> no worries at all. Just wonder if there was a follow-up question or comment you want to make. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to... Um, uh, ask a question, make a comment. Mm. I can see some discussion going on in the chat box, but not uh, no questions per se. And Adrian has been uh, uh, kind of monitoring and managing that discussion. <laughs> it's madness. Yeah. So, yeah like Hi, uh, sorry, can I say something? Of course, yes. I was just about to, to ask you if you, there were any final points you wanted to make. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think uh, related to what Grant comment, uh, comments there, um, personally, my view is how you separate the new so called new corps in China and the old times. Um, uh, government control the branches of uh, marketing and supply corps. I think the main difference is the first principle, the first ICA principle is voluntary. So if you um, can decide to join or not and uh, without being punished, then that's more like a corp. If it's um, pushed through by, by force or by fraud, then it's not a corp. That's a uh, command economy. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think that that's very important. And also I sometimes feel like in a way, maybe because I am kind of into the Chicago or Austrian schools of uh, economics, I would consider, I don't consider personally, I don't consider cooperative cooperativism as um, opposite to individualism somehow i would rather rather consider cooperative cooperativism is based on individualism because that's the first principle of ICA standard it's not pure collectivism similar to communism or in any other sense in that direction i would consider it has to be based on individual voluntary and individual rights of property and their own um, free will so which means it's probably more difficult to be realized in in my home countries and many other parts of the world. But I think um, ideally that's um, the idea I, I want to vote for. So yeah, thank you. Right, unless there are any final uh, comments that anyone likes to make, and I'm just looking if anyone with a hand up, I can't see anybody. Then, then I'll, I'm proposing to draw this session to a close a few minutes ahead of our schedule.